Um, we do have a quorum. We will call the meeting of the Union 38 School Committee Joint Committee meeting to order for uh, April 6, 2021. And Frontier Regional on April 6, 2021, it's 6.02. So can, can I do a, a so quick point of order yeah. and uh, in a quick announcement? So first of all, um, can I have people who are um, not on school committee and not speaking at the moment to turn your cameras off? It's gonna help with bandwidth everybody. It also puts all the school committee on one page because this was kind of their, their meeting. Um, and then we'll call upon you during public comment if you're here for that. This includes administrators. We'll let you guys leave the main screen as well, um, unless you're presenting and then we'll call on you if we need you. Um, and just to mute and unmute, it's control D if you're having trouble with that on your screens. And I did want to just say, um, we have two members that are leaving our, our leaving school committee. Um, they will be recognized probably at their local meetings this month where they have a, uh, public hearings that is, but Trevor McDaniel and Maisie Shaw both have been serving since 2015 and, uh, um, and are leaving us. Um, there are several others that may be coming up for reelection, but we'll see what happens there before we we say hello or goodbye to anybody else. But um, so I want to thank them for their service to the community and the children. You will get a the finest of pens that public monies can buy you, <laughs> not to exceed any amount. Um, yes. But you will you will get that to thank you for your service so that you can sign whatever it is that you sign at home with the actual pen nowadays. So but thank Love you it. so much. And I just want to do while we we're all here because we kind of over this past year certainly became one big um, working community, um, one community working community committee um, this year and, and to suddenly see you disappear from our screens um, will be shocking to those who don't see you day in day out. So we'll, we'll thank you again at your local meetings, but um, just coming from me. So thank you, Ken, for let me jump in there. Thank you. Sure, and, and just administratively, I do want to note into the record that this is a public meeting, uh, a virtual meeting, and it is being recorded for those that are in attendance and may not be aware, we do record uh, our meetings. So uh, we did want to make that very much uh, evident to everyone. So we start the uh, meeting. We have a presentation of prof professional development presentation by Sarah Mitchell, Director of Secondary Education, Kim McCarthy, Curriculum Director for Elementary Focus. Uh, so I will turn the meeting over at this point in time to uh, Sarah and Kim, and then we will go back to the agenda and approve minutes and move on to public comment. So uh, I understand that they have a presentation. They'll probably be sharing a screen or two with us and uh, I'll turn it over. Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone, we're happy to be here tonight. Um, Kim is gonna start us off and we're gonna talk a little bit about not only professional development, a little bit about curriculum, and then we'll wrap up by updating you on what we have planned for the summer. Whoops, Kim, you're still muted. Control D. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was saying hello, everyone, that Sarah and I are very excited to have this opportunity to present at the school committee. We haven't talked much specifically around uh, curriculum and professional development, and we're really honored to be here. And we want to say what a year it's been. Um, it, it, it's been such an amazingly different and challenging year that we want to give you a peek back of what we did and then a peek into what we're going to um, do next year in terms of professional development and curriculum development. But before we do, we want to give a huge heartfelt thanks to our students who we hold so dear and to their families and our deepening partnerships, to our fabulous teachers and staff, who worked countless hours to ensure connections, learning, and joy. They are true living examples of perseverance, resilience, dedication, and hope. We thank you. To school administrators, I'll tell you, this is a team like none other, and oh boy, have we bonded this year. It's hard to express the depth of gratitude and respect that we have for each other, and just how powerful it is 
to be able to rely on one another through the thick and thin and the ups and downs. And of course, we thank all the members of the school committee. Just an amazing job that you did. You dedicated your mind, your heart and time listening to and striving to understand our community's diverse perspectives on health and well-being, education, equity. Also, you can make the best decisions possible in this seemingly impossible time. And we thank you. Yes, what a year it's been. It's been an exhausting one, a validating one, one we will never forget, and one that Sarah and I are honored to remember. So we wanna make sure we thank each and every one of you. So Sarah, we'll go to slide two and we'll start with the overview. And this is where we've been this year. And um, we started the school year with 10 hours of professional development, a gift but a lot of work. And we had to really get our remote learning platforms down. And we could not have done that either without our tech team, Scott, Maureen, Keith, and Stuart. We had to learn new platforms, new ways of teaching, new ways to pivot and, and ways that we didn't know prior to this. Um, it, it, we couldn't have done it without them. And we also used the resource. Uh, we used the distance learning playbook by Fisher, Hattie, and Fry to help us out. In the fair, <laughs> we knew it would be extremely important to establish collaborative teaching teams so that we could have collaborative time, right? Many hands, light work, and the work, work was immense. So we had to figure out <laughs> teaching, how to support our students, fill in possible learning gaps. We hadn't seen some of these students since March. There was a lot of things to think about. So each school developed collaborative learning teams that they continued their professional development with. They planned lessons and they got into this cycle of planning lessons, delivering the lessons, looking at the impact of the lesson, re thinking, replanning, and doing it all over again, a cycle that was very effective and it, and it reflected the hard work and the dedication of the teachers. It was really a fluid instructional design. Okay. We also at that time really committed to uh, anti-racism work and culturally responsive education. We, we took on a lot this year and we worked very hard to come at it from a global perspective. We wanted to strengthen students' sense of identity. We wanted to promote equity and inclusions in the classroom. And we wanted to find ways to really enhance and um, broaden student engagement and critical thinking. And we did this through anti-racism work, culturally responsive education and equitable practices. It's a beginning for us, built on pillars that have been established in the past and we're really excited to work for, move this forward. And I just wanna show you the website that we made um, that, it, that includes all of our anti-racism work and Sarah's gonna just click through a few pages. She's also gonna put the link in the chat so you can look at it on your own time, but it starts with our mission and it goes through the professional development, the curriculum work we do. We're looking at this as a fluid document that will live and grow with us as we work and grow and additions will happen um, th throughout the course of its development and throughout the course of our growth. So, as Kim said, the, the link is in the chat. I believe it's the first link in the chat. Yep. Great. All right. So in addition to doing um, anti-racism work at a district level, uh, PK through 12, um, a lot of teachers and a lot of departments took on this work um, on their own and were reading books. The social studies department just recently launched their blog. This is a place that they're gonna capture um, some of the work that they're doing as a department, course by course. And also it will be a great place for the community to tap into because there's a lot of interesting reading out there. Um, and I've also put this link in the chat. Uh, you can click around and see what they've done. So there'll be some reading suggestions. They'll talk about what's happening in classrooms around this work. 
um, and it, it really came out very nicely. They've been working on this for the last couple of months um, during their PD time and also um, during some of their department meetings that are happening after school. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and I gave you I gave you a quick preview of it because I was on the wrong slide for a little while during Kim's presentation. So now you so now I can go quickly through mine because you've already looked at the slide a little bit. But I wanted to take you a little bit through the um, the work of curriculum that's happened in the district, and also to give you a perspective on what we're going to be embarking on for the next three to five years. So prior to 1993, um, those of you who were in education prior to 1993 probably have a fairly good sense of what happened. Depending on what district you were in, what school you were working at, um, you entered the school building, you were handed a textbook or a packet of materials, you were given the key to your classroom and said, okay, have at it. Um, a lot of the work that we were doing in those days were based on um, certainly some standards, uh, but there wasn't anything that was really uniform that went across the state or across the nation. Um, the pendulum off, often swings in curriculum. And so in 1993, it really began that hard swing where we were looking at assessment and standards and they were looking for a more unified approach uh, to curriculum development and to um, assessment. In the early days, uh, Frontier and the elementary schools had notebooks and binders. We had it all in paper. Um, teachers were uh, using syllabuses that they had created. We've always been a small district and a nimble district. We've been able to meet the needs of our students. And in those days, we were doing it with paper. In 2006, we adopted a software platform, platform called Rubicon Atlas. And that was what we were using as our file cabinet. Um, you do want to have written curriculum because you need to be able to give new teachers or new to frontier teachers something in writing that provides them with a roadmap. Um, and so we used that software for about 15 years and it was always a work in progress um, because you're never finished revising or writing curriculum. We we're always adding new courses, uh, new standards were coming along and we would always be revising new courses. And so the curriculum that's in Rubicon Atlas is in various states of completion or um, in progress. It's 2001. Um, there is a lot more technology that is out there today, and there's a lot more ability of districts to design their own platform. And so we feel like we're ready to embark on that, and we're going to be using a combination of um, Google Sites, uh, Google Docs, and using a lot of the professional development that we've been doing over the last 10 to 12 years to shape and inform what we put in these documents. It's not to say that we're scrapping all the curriculum that we've had in place, certainly not. Uh, we're just giving it a new look and a new format, and then we're examining it through a new lens. Um, so I'll just show you, and I've thrown this in the link as well, We've developed a little bit of a how-to document that we'll be revising and refining as we um, as we go through this process. We have a group that's been gathering at Frontier. Uh, we've met a couple of times, and they've been advising on the format. We'll do something similar at the elementary. Uh, we will have a unified PK through 12 approach, um, but we may do something a little bit different with the formats depending on the needs of each grade level. Um, so a lot of this will look familiar. Learning objectives, we're always going to have learning objectives in our curriculum. We're always going to have assessment. But some of the professional development that we've um, taken over the last 10 years, we have spent about three years working on differentiation, and we did not have a section in our old curriculum maps that dealt with differentiation. So that will be something new that we'll be adding in. We're also working on, as Kim mentioned, the culturally responsive curriculum. And so we'll have a space in the maps for that as well, so that we can um, analyze and examine our uh, curriculum through an anti-racist and culturally responsive lens. So that about covers those pieces. Hold on, let me get to, get to the next part. Um, and so Kim will talk a little bit about what we're planning for professional development this spring. 
So we always plan professional development within our within our close world context, thinking about the broader world, and we want input from all the stakeholders possible. So we sent out surveys this spring to family and staff about professional development, and we gathered recommendations from the Anti-Racism Committee and then input from our Special Education Parent Advisory Council, our school leadership teams from PK through 12, the administrative team, and then the various consultants that worked with us this year. And we wanted to gather broad input because the curriculum and professional development feeds into the things that we do each and every day in the classroom, how we teach, what we teach, how we support learning for our diverse learners. And we want ownership and um, investment in this to really make effective changes. So we, we gathered a lot of information and analyzed those. And then in the next slide, it was really all, all arrows pointed to working on these topics. So it's really an integration of uh, culturally responsive education within a tiered system of support. And we look at culturally responsive education as looking at the intersectionality of who our students and our families are, their race, their culture, their identity, their abilities in school, their experiences. We want to look at all of those pieces and be able to respond to them in a very effective way and provide supports across levels of intensity for, to meet the needs of the students. We are um, getting ahead and doing kind of a proactive mental health supports. We um, are anticipating that this pandemic has had an impact on all children's uh, mental health, all families, all staff. I, I think we can say uh, it's been really hard, right? So, so we've got some good plans around the mental health supports and the social emotional growth and development. We always ask that question, where are our kids? How are they doing? How are they doing academically? How are they doing in their connections with others? And we've taken a close look through their day-to-day -day performance in our school to really mine the gap, if you will, and to bring in the resources that we can to support those individual children. Your children are resilient and our teachers are facile and we will meet the children where they are and bring them forward and hold them dearly to us as we move forward. And really to do that, that's the big, big idea, culturally responsive education within a tiered system of support. It includes anti-racism, inclusion, differentiation, assessment, family engagement, all of those pieces to help steer what we do and how we do it in our classroom. Great, so I'm gonna show you a little bit about of what we developed. So this is very, very much in draft format. Um, I shared this, um, I believe I shared this in the link also. Um, it will show you a little bit about what we're planning. So you can see that we're doing some revisiting of past presenters, um, mostly in preparation for our curriculum writing project. Uh, for example, we'll have Mike Anderson back uh, for a session or two. Um, we're still booking these people. It's still a little bit early. Uh, to get these folks on the calendar, so we'll see what happens. Um, but we're going to revisit a lot of the presentations that we've had over the years because we do have new faculty. We want to make sure that everyone's on the same page as we move forward with uh, writing the curriculum. Um, you can see that there is a lot of um, professional development um, on anti-racism. Again, uh, we certainly don't leave a theme after one year. Uh, this will be a, a few years of a theme. We heavily concentrate for a, and focus for a few years. And then it becomes um, something that we obviously continue to work on, but we may not have as many uh, PD sessions on. But this year is certainly not one of those years for anti-racism. Um, we are still delivering our doing our special ed delivery model at the high school. And so we'll receive some professional development on that. Uh, the elementary schools um, are working a lot with the teacher proposals, and that will have um, a focus on culturally relevant teaching, um, as well as building-based um, sessions. And all of this will be used to help with that larger project of uh, curriculum um, redesign. So we hope you can see how we're embedding all these initiatives into one piece of professional development and curriculum development to support the needs 
of our students and, and our society. Um, I want to go back a little bit and we're coming off. So you've, we've taken all this student data and, and uh, input from multiple stakeholders. But I also want to talk a little bit more because I know people worry, what's the impact on my child's academic growth? And I started off by saying that we created these teaching teams, right? Many hands, many eyes on children, many many different layers where we can pivot and approach and work with kids. And that allowed us to gather data, whether it was student, a student project or, or an assignment or an observation of a student or an assessment, right? And to look at that and be able to then provide targeted instruction within the classroom, within a different instructional designs, whether it's small group or individual time or it varies depending, and we were able to do that at each school to meet the needs. And then the middle school and um, high school added other components to it as well that Sarah will let you know. Yep. So in December or in the fall, we had a program for middle school students called Get Organized. Um, and the program was designed to help students basically organize their homework, organize assignments, and really just deal with this, um, this new world of hybrid learning. Um, that ended December 6th because we were running that on Wednesdays during our early release Wednesdays. And when early release ended, we knew that the need had not ended. So we shifted to a targeted tutoring support program with one-on-one -on -one tutoring for a couple of hours a week for students um, in specific topics or classes that they were having um, difficulty um, passing or um, getting the grades that they wanted to get. Whoops, you're muted, cute. Kim, sorry. <laughs> I'm so worried that there's going to be environmental noise, so I, <laughs> I don't want that to happen. But so this all lets us to tell you that we're anticipating there's going to be about 20% of our student population gathering some kind of academic services this summer, whether it is through camps or very targeted um, instruction. We are offering 16 programs throughout our schools. 16 programs, programs at every school. There's early childhood programs that will be full running. We are so excited to announce that um, Sunderland's early childhood program will go back to incorporating our youngest English language learners. This is an initiative that we started in 2019 that we can re-establish re uh, this year and we're very, very thrilled about that. Instead of in the past, we ran a two-week reading camp. We are this summer at each elementary school going to run a four week for the month of July in-person academic camp that focus on reading, math, and social emotional development through targeted instruction and collaborative problem solving projects. So the joy and the hands-on and the small group will, will be there. And also at every school, there's highly specialized programs to meet the significant and complex needs of um, our identified special education students. And then Sarah's programs at the high school have expanded as well. So we're doing our traditional jumpstart programs, which is for students that are entering six, grades six, seven, and eight. We'll be focusing on math primarily this year um, to try to boost uh, that uh, subject area. We'll also be brand new this year introducing a credit recovery program. And so our plan is to run a five-week program four days a week. We are going to offer some of the classes will be live in person. Um, if we have enough students that um, need that particular course, we're gonna to try to find an instructor and um, get that off the ground. Uh, for courses that may have just one or two students that need that credit recovery, we'll use the Edgenuity program, which is a, a software online program. However, we'll be doing it in person at school. So each one of those students will have a learning coach that will help them get through the content in that course. Uh, the last thing that we want to do is put students that weren't successful with remote learning back in a situation where they're remote learning. Um, and so that coaching support will be really um, imperative. So students will have an opportunity to take up to two courses this summer. Um, we're gonna see how it goes if our participation is strong and we feel that we need another summer to really get students back on track for graduation, um, then we'll consider running it um, next, next summer as well. Um, the last thing we want is students to not graduate with their class because of a pandemic, which is totally out of their control. 
Um, normally we scoop up students in school and we funnel them and get them through their courses and their coursework. Um, and this year was just that much more challenging. So again, we're closing with a big thank you to all of you. Uh, we really, really thank you. And if you have any questions, please let us know. <clears throat> well, well, Tim and Sarah, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, it goes without saying for the work putting together the programs this year. Um, I mean, your, your work is um, always timely and, uh, and, and greatly appreciated in these uh, past 12 to 18 months. Uh, you've gone even further than you normally do in trying to help the uh, district and the, you know, the administration and staff weather this storm. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this um, quick overview of how things are going and what the plans are, you know, moving forward with the spring and into the summer and on into next year. So thank you for that. Um, I think we are now ready to move on to minutes. And um, we have the minutes of uh, quite a few minutes here to, to consider. October 8th, 2019, March 16th, 2020, March 17th, 2020, uh, tw March 23, 2020, April 1, 2020, <laughs> September 3, 2020, and December 22, 2020. These are all joint committee meeting <clears throat> minutes. So, um, Judy, I would how do you entertain a motion for the that's right. Judy, how do you how do you want to do it, Judy? We do a motion. <laughs> Go ahead and start the motion, Ken. I was going to entertain a motion to approve all of those various minutes so that we can get them on the floor for discussion. And then we can I, I'd like to see if we can vote them all at once. If we don't have any major changes or revisions to any of them, we should be able to just so, do it as we so move, Trevor McDaniel. Okay. For the union. Move for the region, Mr. Chair. Does anybody have any comments about the about the minutes? Do we have a second? Let's get a second for both of them. Second for the union, Mr. Corwin. Second and for Olivia, the second for us. Can Thanks, you hear the Olivia. second for Frontier? Olivia. Thank you. Okay. Um, can, I'm, I'm happy to do a roll call. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm happy to roll call for you. I just want to revisit. I want to make sure that the three people I had missing did not dip and did not jump into the the pool while we were talking, while Sarah and um, Kim were doing their presentation. So mm -hmm. I have absent Ashley Dion, Elaine Campbell, and Denise Storm. Is that still the case? And I think more I saw where Maureen left. Maureen Nichols left the meeting. I don't know if she came back in. She I'm back here. on. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you, Maureen. I, I, yeah. I saw you left. I didn't see if you came back in. So thank yeah, you. I, I lost the signal. Okay. <laughs> the, the only comment I would have on the minutes is that it's just it's really sobering to read them and look at how far this community has come in a year and all the hard work you have done. Uh, just not knowing where we were oh. uh, back in you know back in March and. Um, as you as you read through it, it's amazing. It's only been a year and a, and a little bit, but um, just great work by all of you. It's been uh, such an honor to have worked alongside you through this time. So that's it. Thank you for saying that, Trevor. It uh, was going through my mind as I read them too. It's been a long, long process. And, yep. Uh, <clears throat> and we, we still, still have a little bit more to go. <laughs> yes. yes, we do. Uh, do we need to sort the, do we need to sort these out, Judy, as to who was there and who wasn't? No. So what I Donna and I actually went back and forth about this, and Donna confirmed back for me that if you were not, she went to MASC and she confirmed that if you were not present at the meeting, you can still vote on the minutes. Correct. So this yes, isn't all. Can. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so. So do you want to do one roll call? I. Uh, I would do, like to do one roll call, and this will be voting members only. I'd be calling them. I, I would call their names for the for the uh, union, Union Thirty Eight, and uh, 
I assume Bob would, or do you want to call the names, Judy? Is it easier for you? I think, um, is it easy for you, Judy? No, that's fine. You ready? Okay. okay, I'm going to do, because uh, they're in order, this order on the page, I'm going to do them Frontier first. Bob Halla? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Bill? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Judy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Missy? Yes. And Olivia? Yes. And then, Ken, you want to do just voting members or you want to do everybody? Just, just voting members. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Phil? Yes. 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 David? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Bob? Yeah. Bob yes. Halla. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Michael? Yes. Ken? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Peter? I saw Peter on a minute ago. I Peter? I saw him on also. Oh, raising his hand. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Um, Maureen? Yes. And Bethany? Yes. Good job. So that was October 8th, March 16th, March 17th, March 23rd, April 1st, December 22nd. Okay. Public comment. We are moving on to public comment. <clears throat> um, we have a, a three people, or I'm aware of three people that would like to make comments or read comments uh, into the record. And so I would start with um, Shelly Egginski. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Is Shelly on? I thought I saw her name earlier. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm on. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so my, my comment- Go ahead and- Um, so, so my comment is, is going to be on the um, anti-racism um, curriculum that is that is currently um, being, I guess, maybe reinstituted in our schools, and um, probably forewarning that it's it's, it's not going to be a, a popular opinion. But you know, I owe it, I owe it to myself to, to to state where I'm where I'm coming from and and, and what I think of this curriculum. Um, so racism in our country is a problem. I have great empathy for anyone who has personally experienced being judged or mistreated based solely on the color of their skin. I believe it is important for our children to be taught about racism. otherwise known as critical race theory, which in my opinion, does more to divide our community and country around racial issues than it does to unite. The main goal of this theory is to convince young, impressionable minds that if you are white, you are inherently racist. Not one person to date has been able to answer for me how this ideology is not racist itself. Furthermore, if you try to disagree or oppose this ideology, you are not only racist, but you are the racist of the racist, the most uneducated of the uneducated, and the most unenlightened of the unenlightened. As I first stated, racism is a problem in our country. However, I do not believe critical race theory is the solution and will only divide our community and country more. Furthermore, it oozes with a political agenda Hence, by it is being taught to our children at a younger and younger age, what some may refer to as indoctrination. In summary, in my opinion, critical race theory is a radical progressive ideology that inserts race and racism into every aspect of our lives and will only continue to foster division, anger, and violence. 
Respectfully, in my opinion, it has no place, especially in our elementary schools and pre-K classes. Martin Luther King Jr. and his teachings, I am all for. He once said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Sadly, critical race theory teaches the opposite. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shelley. Um, <clears throat> next, I, wanted, I had down that Lisa Gaylor or someone would be reading a statement from the uh, teachers union. Yes, I can, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll actually be reading okay. it. Um, before okay. I read it though, I just want to take, take a minute to thank all of the school committees, the administration, the community. It has been a very challenging year but I think that we've all worked really well together for the benefit of our students. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank so you. I'm reading um, Union 38 Teachers Association Anti-Racism District Mission Statement. Given the events at the Capitol on January 6th, the horrific crime that took place earlier in March in Georgia, and now the tragic details that have been unfolding during the trial in Minneapolis, the Union 38 Teachers Association recognizes the urgency of the anti-racist work we have begun as a district. Silence and neutrality are no longer options. Although our school communities are bucolic on many levels, our towns are not free from prejudice. We are painfully aware that some of our students and their families experience discrimination. The MTA states, quote, as educators, we have the platform to teach our students about racism, white supremacy, and xenophobia, and how to confront them in all their forms. As we see rising white nationalist terrorism, we must be more vigilant and active than ever before in condemning hatred and standing alongside those who are the targets of such injustice, end quote. We invite all of our members to take the Black Lives Matter at school pledge while considering all those who are marginalized. As educators and allies, we will work to address the inequities that result from institutionally racist policies and practices in our schools and the communities in which our students live. <coughs> we choose not to accept these conditions as they exist, but to accept the responsibility for changing them. We pledge to take actions that will address access and opportunity for all students by highlighting inequities and increasing awareness, organizing for change and growing the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, the next uh, we would hear from Dana Levine. Hello. Welcome. Hello. So I have to um, second my uh, viewpoint of Shelley. I'm actually quite concerned about the level of un inequality in our school district when it comes to our viewpoints. What concerns me most is we're starting to see this very liberal agenda, but yet it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think exemplify exactly what our town represents. I believe we have a very conservative uh, group of people here in uh, Deerfield and in our surrounding towns that are unrepresentative of what is going on in the school district. So I, I guess that this very liberal approach is um, also concerning in that, you know, when, when you teach a child uh, to do something, you don't teach a child what not to do. You teach a child what to do. Right. And you always leave out what not to do is to not create a, a confusion 
that a child may have. Um, I don't know if you understand where I'm going with this, but I think this anti-racism is more of a direction where um, you're trying to teach children what they shouldn't be or who they shouldn't be rather than what they should be. And so uh, I guess one of the things that concerns me, the other thing that concerns me is that we're talking about children who are still establishing their belief systems. And what I've seen so far watching uh, some of the Zoom classroom sessions is that we have teachers at the high school who are um, who are teaching their agenda, who are very left wing, who say things that are very left wing. And I've said in a post in Deerfield now that I grew up in a family uh, with very liberal parents who are they're you know Democrats, you know, one hundred percent. And my mother specifically said to me that if you know your teacher's political affiliation, they should not be teaching. And uh, we're getting that now in the high school uh, classroom, just listening in to, onto some of these classrooms. I'm, that upsets me more than anything else because our children are still creating a belief system and they're not getting it from both sides. They're getting it from one view. <laughs> And I wish more people would start watching what's going on in some of these classrooms, especially your government classrooms, where you know that they're going to start talking about um, what's going on in our government now. So um, I, I do want to ask, I know that we have uh, racist issues. However, we are uh, not far, we are as a white community as you can get. So I guess I want to ask, is this curriculum, was this curriculum put together based on um, racist events that happened in our school system that rallied the school committee to be able to, um, to put this curriculum together? Or are we just kind of following suit from all the other schools that are, are around us? Can I have an answer? Are you well? Let me let me just ask this, Dan. Are you done with your statement, or? Well, I got a few more things. Well, why don't you go through your things, and then I can I'll respond to your question um, as to how the the um, effort began in the okay. schools. So the other thing is is because of this new curriculum that's being added into the school system. What is being taken out that this is being put in? So that's my that's my second question, and um, my third question is: Is there a standard for teachers to notify students if um, if they are in jeopardy just weeks, just like a week before uh, the curriculum ends, and not the day before or not the day of? Um, that's my third question. And um, and that's it. Okay. Um, I, I, I can't personally respond to your, your second two questions, but I, I think before I move on to the other comments and things that will be, uh, I'll be reading into the record, um, I, I would point out that the current curriculum that's being developed by the schools is a direct response, Dana, to correspondence that was received from over 200 frontier alumni who expressed concern with the lack of um, education that they received when it came to uh, racial awareness and um, dealing with the issues of race, race uh, in, at frontier and in society in general. So there was a letter that came to the administration last year and the administration reacted to it by putting together a broad range of people on committees to develop and, and implement a new curriculum uh, or new curriculum efforts that will weave in discussion of race and, and other matters into the uh, general education in the Union 38 and Frontier Regional Schools. So that's that's where those came from. 
I don't know if Darius, if you wanted to speak to the other two or if um, you'd prefer to, to respond after the fact, I don't know. So before I move on to read the, the four or five other comments that we have. I, don't know. I think you did a nice job answering that there, Ken. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure uh, public discussion is not a debate. So I'm going in, I'm not going to go down that route. The, um, you know, regards to whether or not your child was notified about a failing grade, I think you need to take that up directly with the principal. Um, that's not, you know, there is a policy on when things are reported, when grades are reported. There's, you know, we have an online grading book. So if, there, if there's a misconnection there with you as a parent, you should contact your principal. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to move on. You'll have, I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, I'm not at home, so I'm working off of an iPad. I'm not nearly as adept at running a meeting on an iPad as I uh, as I am on my computer. I've, I've gotten a little bit more familiar with it on the computer, but not definitely don't know what I'm doing on the iPad. So please bear with me. Uh, the first item I'm going to read is a letter from. Uh, Sarah Colsey, Colsey, and I apologize if I mispronounced the name, but, uh, uh, and uh, it came to us, it reads as follows, Dear School Committee members and administrators, I am writing this letter to you today with three concerns I have about the school year currently. I appreciate your time in reading this letter and understanding the concerns I have. Thank you. My first concern is with mask use and physical activities. As our weather starts to warm up in these last couple of months of school, I am concerned about the children wearing masks outside and in particular during gym class and recess. When we had the 60 degree plus weather a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I watched the children outside running around. They were red faced and having a hard time breathing. My youngest son came home with headaches and was exhausted. The WHO recommends not using face masks on children during physical activities and sports. I am attaching some studies to this letter showing the dangers of mask use and, phys excuse me, and physical activities. Our children have been in school since October. They are still socially distanced, they are still in their pods, and teachers and staff are now being vaccinated. Children very rarely get COVID, and there have been no cases of a child passing it to anyone else, especially in our community. I kindly ask that, like with the option of hybrid and remote, that masks at least outside become optional as well, not just for students, but for faculty and staff who wish to not wear them up outside. My second concern is the culturally responsive educational curriculum being implemented in the schools. I understand the thought process behind wanting to be a more inclusive community and equitable. I understand why people feel the need to discuss racism with children and educate in order to combat it. I believe that racism needs to be discussed and that children, parents along with some adults, close parents, need to be informed on the dangers of racism and what it can do to people and our society as a whole. What I have a problem with is how it is being taught in the schools. At the very beginning of the school year, a video was shown on Greenfield Public Television and advertised to FRS students to watch. I watched the video. It showed a bunch of children from all walks of life and different races slash nationalities learning about racism. One of the very first things said was that all white people are racist. It then went on to tell the children that no other race can be racist, just white people. This kind of thought process and narrative is extremely dangerous and is in itself racist, r racism. The kind of thought process and narrative is extremely dangerous. Oh, and the definition of being a rapist, racist is judging people based solely on the color of their skin. To say that all people are racist because they are white is disgusting, extremely divisive. I watched the reaction of the children watching the video. Comments in the chat of the video became angry and turned troublesome. Some will argue that the comments just prove how racist our community and schools are, while others will argue that the comments just prove how racist our community and schools are. While others will argue it shows how angry the children became due to the constant text of that video and how they were troubled by the thought processes and what they themselves were being called. You can decide for yourself how to interpret the children's reaction. Throughout the years so far, I have watched as my sixth grader is being read and reading books constantly about some form of racism, books that are clearly a one-sided perspective. When I questioned the books and asked for a more 
inclusive selection of books, I received a thank you for my concerns and that they would be shared with the committees involved in the planning. I take responsibility for not voicing my concerns more and not questioning things again sooner. There are many different voices, authors who have uh, published books about racism, many different perspectives, yet only one side is being taught in the schools. People will argue saying that it is not true. Politics are not involved in the curriculum. That is not how some of us see it. I am a conservative. There are lots of conservative authors who specialize in racism, have studied it, been victims of it, and would offer valuable insight. Yet those authors are never discussed. You cannot have an equitable education on this subject if it is only a one-sided perspective. Children need to be able to form their own <clears throat> uh, opinions, weigh all of the facts, and form their own conclusions. It is never okay to tell someone their opinions, their concerns don't matter. <clears throat> Especially children. This is their most informative years. They are sponges. They want to learn. Last year and this year are put our children behind acad academically by a lot. Our children are not up to grade level in things like math, reading, and science. These should be the top concern on every educator's plate along with the parents. Yet here we are discussing more ways to implement culturally responsive education in our children. Multiple staff members are focusing on this curriculum and attending countless meetings while the children are left to learn on their own on a computer. Wednesdays in particular have not been very educational for months. I and many others in the community are becoming more and more concerned with how this curriculum seems to be a main focus in school. As I said, some of us see it as political. Personally, my beliefs are politics and religion have very little place in the schools, in particular the elementary schools. How would the community feel if some of us started to try to force religion in the schools? Ironically, in Massachusetts, there are laws in the books that religion is supposed to be taught. Mass General Chap Law Chapter 71, Section 31 states Bible reading. <clears throat> a portion of the Bible shall be read daily in the public schools without written note or oral comment, but a pupil whose parent or guardian informs the teacher in writing that he has conscientious scruples against it shall not be required to read from any particular version or to take any personal part in the reading. The school committee shall not purchase or use in the public schools school books favoring the tenets of any particular religious sect. I am pretty sure this would not go over well amongst some in the community. I kindly ask that this curriculum be dialed back so that fundamental, fundamental subjects can be focused on more and if, that if this curriculum is going to continue, it becomes a more inclusive unit with more diverse viewpoints. My third concern is bullying. Sadly, I'm not seeing it so much from the children, but from the adults. This nation is extremely divided and so is our community. I am seeing people attack others in very personal ways because they do not share the same political and or moral viewpoints. Adults are not debating anymore. They are resorting to name calling and personal attacks on people's families. I do not expect the cool co school committees to be able to change the behaviors of the adults, but I would ask that for the children's sake, a stronger, focus be implemented in the schools about bullying. Cyberbullying is extremely rampant and it has even gone further than that. Physical attacks and slanderous hate mail have also taken place in our community. A reminder to the students about bullying and how to report it would be appreciated. Thank you again for reading my concerns and for all that you do for our schools, children and community. All my best, Sarah Colsey. So, um, I have a couple more here. You have to bear with me while I try and find them. Uh, and thank you, Sarah, for your thoughts. Um, on one. <clears throat> From Annie Curtis, I have the following. Dear school committee members, I recently read a letter from the superintendent speaking out against recent hate crimes while acknowledging the hopeful outlook on the future of anti-racist education in the district. I want to thank the superintendent, committee members, citizens, and educators who have worked tirelessly over the last year to support an anti-racist curriculum. Our oldest child will start preschool in the fall and will be of the first classes to graduate from Frontier with a full school experience that includes an anti-racist education. 
After researching our town's budget and reflecting on the year we've had, I've come to a personal conclusion that Mr. Modesto has the most difficult job in our town government. He manages at least 65% of the town's budget, oversees the largest number of staff, monitors maintenance on large buildings, and is responsible for the curriculum and de development of our children. All of this during an unprecedented global pandemic and reimagining of traditional education. I hope as a town, we ensure that he and our educators have everything they need to continue this important work. Again, thank you again to everyone at all levels for their contributions. Annie, Annie Curtis. Thank you, Annie. Um, the next one uh, would be coming from, I believe, Lou Vincent, if I can find it. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Um, let me try Kate Lawless. I, that's the first one I've run across. Uh, we have a comment here from Kate Lawless dated Tuesday, April 6th. Dear school committee members, first, thank you for serving our town to a different difficult year. I'm writing to express support for a curriculum that aims to shine light on the contributions of all citizens, not just those of the dominant white culture. The efforts of the anti-racism and equity subcommittee are important for those students of color in the district so that they see people like themselves represented. They are also important for white students so they learn that the white point of view is not the only one. We shortchange ourselves as a community if we close ourselves to the voices and the achievements of artists, writers, and leaders who are black, brown, Asian, LGBTQ+, older adults, and people with different abilities. For selfish reasons, let's embrace the depth of what being a human is. We also perpetuate harm when we exclude those, these voices and achievements. A school should not be harming its students. When we reflect on what it means to be American, what generations of soldiers fought for, we think of freedom, parens, let's appreciate that, close parens. We think of opportunities, parens, let's be grateful for what we have, close parens. We think of a country that, at its best, welcomes all. Our country has not always been its best self. We have hurt people on a massive scale. That's just reality. Telling the truth about that is an important step to healing the wounds that we created. Telling the good truths and the bad truths about all our citizens adds to the depth of our great nation. Thank you for attempting to bring these truths to light for our students and for your grace in handling criticism from those who disagree with you. Sincerely, Kate Laws. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. We have a um, statement from the um, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, which I'm, wow. <clears throat> and this is also dated April 6, 2021. Dear Frontier Regional and Union 38 School Committee members, I am writing to you on behalf of the Frontier Regional and Union 38 Special Education Parent Advisory Council. We want to applaud the work being done by the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee. It is clear they are truly invested in creating better, more inclusive environment for all students in this district. It is imperative that all students feel safe and supported so that all students have an equal opportunity to learn and succeed. The CPAC was able to meet with a member of the committee to discuss the addition of disability inclusion curriculum, and we are excited to be able to partner with this dedicated group. The March 31st letter from Mr. Modesto set a tone of hope and open communication. We encourage everyone to reach out to the district with concerns or suggestions. It is through this partnership with administrators, teachers, families, and community members that we can make our schools safe spaces for all students. <clears throat> Thank you for your time, Holly Johnson, co-chair, Asia Cerrone, <clears throat> co-chair, Carrie Thurlow, secretary, and Crystal Brown, treasurer. Ken, would you like someone else to read some of these? Um, Sure, and I don't have this to is, there. Go ahead. Oh, I have this is Maureen. Okay. I just feel bad for <laughs> reading all of them. I, I found um, the Lou Vincent one. I can read okay. that. If you want to uh, read that, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. 
Dear school committee members, please read at our April 6th meeting. As a parent of children who are people of color in the school, I want to say thank you for the anti-racism and equity work that is happening in the district. Thank you to school committee members who have agreed to participate in the anti-racism professional development program that the elementary schools did this year. Thank you to the superintendent for making strong public statements about the ongoing need for this crucial work. Thank you to the teachers working hard to bring reality into the classrooms. Thank you to Amanda Mosia for advising and guiding efforts to begin on the road to a better community for all students. Thank you to the Anti-Racism and Equity Task Force for beginning the work of change making on many levels. Thank you for outside agencies who have spent time educating this year at our schools. Thank you to administrators, curriculum directors, and staff for turning their attention to the urgent need to address issues that have gone long unattended. It is no small undertaking to examine our schools, community, and selves to gain a better understanding of systemic racism and equities. And it is work that desperately needs to be done. Our community, as well as our children, benefit from gaining understanding and knowledge about the true condition of our country. Facing and understanding history and current realities is not easy. I am very supportive of efforts being made to become a more equitable school district. There is a long way to go and much needs to happen. 300 years of education in a state of inequity and systemic racism will not be resolved overnight or in a year. The commitments of each person to take on this work creates a community centered in truth and real care. Care for our current students and families and care for our future. I am committed to being a part of education, <clears throat> actions, and commitments on the path of anti-racism and equity in our district. I will continue to support these efforts in FRSU 38. Every child benefits from truth, justice, and care. Kindly, Lou Vincent. Thank you. Um, Thank you Marie. You're welcome. I, I, I have the last, last one here. It's uh, <clears throat> from Erica Higgins-Ross also dated Tuesday, April 6, 2021. To the FRSU 38 School Committee, I would just want to weigh in before the meeting tonight to express my support for the excellent anti-racism and equity work that Frontier and the FRSU 38 schools have undertaken this year. I look forward to the further development of truthful, challenging curriculum that helps our students think critically and address unjust and inequitable systems throughout their lives. I am so impressed with the students, staff, faculty, administrators, and community members who are facing systemic racism and injustice and making sure all students feel welcome and represented in our schools. Best, Erica Ross. So I, I do wanna say um, thank you to everyone for all of the um, input and comments th that were sent in tonight and for the Shelly and Dana and Lisa for their uh, statements that they, they read as well. Um, it is the first year of this work on this. Uh, I appreciate hearing the feedback and, and comments that are coming from all front, uh, all sides here. And I know that the uh, committee will continue to work and accept feedback and work to uh, build a, a, you know, a successful program. So thank you again. That I think public comment that everything I had on my list. Um, oh, I do. So I think we're ready to move on to business, Bob. Yeah, go ahead. Bob, did you, you want to start us on com committee business? Um, the first one is um, anti-racism and equality subcommittee progress update. Sure. Do we have a representative? Oh, there's Chelsea. Hey. Um, Hi, Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea. Uh, and I believe Amanda is here, too. We're going to kind of give you a... Yes. Hi. <laughs> there you are. Um, 
So I'm going to kind of start us off with sort of a summing up where we've been this year and what we reminding us all of, of what we've done. Um, and then Amanda is going to speak a little bit more to um, where we're going. Um, and the, the full committee itself will be meeting again um, in May to really set some solid goals um, for our work next year. Um, but we, we have a sense of, of we have a sense of the work that's ahead. So we'll talk we'll speak to that, too. Um, so I'm going to remind us back in the fall, we started with our professional development, um, which Sarah and Kim have already kind of touched on. So we had a district wide professional development. Um, with all five schools that Amanda led. Um, and then the elementary continued with their two tracks um, where they could sort of pick their focus if they wanted to do examining privilege or if they wanted to do a little bit more of um, the history side of things. And then at Frontier, we worked with Radical em Empathy Consulting um, and did a lot of work with personal bias and getting comfortable having uncomfortable conversations in the classroom. Um, we also, in the fall, had an additional district-wide professional development day with multiple programming, um, including a presentation by Dr. Elizabeth Pryor, specifically on how to address use of the N-word in academic settings, um, because we know that that does come up in literature. So, uh, And some of our teachers do teach books that contain the N-word, like To Kill a Mockingbird or Fences. Um, so that was a helpful, a helpful professional development. Um, to address how you prepare your students to come across the N-word in an academic setting. Um, also in the fall, we did our kickoff at Frontier with um, partnering with HERCOG. We participated in their screening of the documentary, I'm Not Racist, Am I? Um, and then the following day had a follow-up video that was specific to our school and had messages from teachers and students um, from Darius and George and Scott, um, kind of letting students know like, hey, this is a focus this year and this is what this means. Um, so that was definitely a learning curve. Um, we, we did have some, some comments come from some of our students during, during that, um, but we also had students who were really engaged and really um, demonstrated that they were curious, they wanted to know more, they wanted to have these conversations. Um, and also since that incident, we have heard from other schools in the district, like, well, yeah, that happened with your kid, with your students, but you were also the only school that engaged with that documentary and made it part of your curriculum. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a learning experience, but it was also, I think, kudos to us for putting ourselves out there and taking that risk, um, and saying, you know what, we're going to engage with our whole student body. Um, in, in ways that other, other schools um, chose not to do. Um, so also in the fall, we launched our logo redesign. Um, so we invited our students to submit ideas for what our official Red Hawk logo could be. Um, and we also provided some information on why we were doing that um, and a little bit of education on where um, some of our older logos came from and how some of them were overtly racist and some of them are more um, getting into cultural appropriation. And that's why we launched this campaign to create a new logo. Um, we also created a glossary of terms to use across classrooms and across um, schools at the elementary level and selected classroom reading books at the elementary level that have anti-racist themes. Um, we reviewed and revised the student handbooks. We polled staff and identified gaps in understanding about our discipline policies and procedures um, around addressing microaggressions and addressing racist incidents. Um, and then also in the fall, our middle school, the eighth grade read stamped as part of their ELA curriculum, um, which was a big step and that was really exciting. So, and that was all just the fall. <laughs> so catching us up to, to now in the spring, um, the elementary schools have continued working with Amanda and also Sapphire and Romina from the Collaborative. Um, and they've really begun looking at their curriculum and applying some of what they learned in the fall into, okay, what does this look like in a classroom? Um, at Frontier, we're continuing our work with Radical Empathy Consulting. We actually have our last session with them tomorrow. Um, and there is a, as Sarah mentioned, there's a group um, that's beginning to look at our curriculum mapping. 
um, and how we're going to be doing that and also how that's going to include specific space for anti-racism resources and units within this within the curriculum um, for uh, more frontier curriculum we've added an african-american studies class next semester or next year um, that at the moment does have enough students registered to run so that's very exciting and we also have we took the peer leadership group um, and we've created a class called media activism and social change so that will also be running next year um, and the hope with that is that because we'll have designated time during the school day, we'll be able to use that group um, to interact more with both the middle school and the elementary schools. So we're very excited about that. Um, and speaking of our peer leadership group, we have completed at this point six um, open discussion groups um, that they, the students have led, students have decided what the topics are. Um, the, the adults who are in those discussions, we really, as much as possible, try to just sit back and let the students run with it. We're really just there to make sure that, you know, if the conversation dies down, we can kind of help them get it going again. Um, but it really is all student led. And they have just come up with um, what they want to talk about for April and May. Um, so at the end of the year, we will have done 10 of those um, discussion groups. And we typically have between 30 and 40 students that choose to come and participate in those groups, uh, which has been really exciting. Um, and then we do have a logo update, but I will save that for later. I think there's another uh, exciting unveiling of that coming later. Um, and then just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, again, as Sarah and Kim mentioned, there is now a website where we can kind of um, consolidate all of this information and make it a little bit easier for the community to access it. Uh, and we are working on getting a newsletter off the ground. Um, we're very, we really want our students to be involved in this. Um, so we did let students um, take that. And, and with the end of the, with the end of the quarter three, um, it's been a little, a little bumpy getting it off the ground, but a newsletter is coming, I promise. Um, so that's kind of where we have been. Um, which is looking at it all together. And I do have a document that I'll share with you all um, after the meeting. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive what we have managed to do um, in this weird remote world um, and with so many other challenges and so many other things going on. Um, but with that said, there is still a lot to do um, and a lot of work ahead of us. And so I will turn it over to Amanda um, to fill in anything that I may have missed and also to speak to um, where we're headed as we continue with this work. Hello, everyone. Um, Kelsey, I think you covered. <laughs> I don't know about all of it. There's so much. Maybe you missed some stuff, but I think you, you covered everything that I can think of. Um, but in terms of where we're going, um, it's really about creating more structure around this work and um, thinking about how we can just deepen this work in community with each other, utilizing the expertise of this committee, um, utilizing the passion of, this, of these different committees, um, and really making sure that we are able to sustain this. So it's thinking about things like regularly scheduled meetings and who's reporting to whom, all of these nitty gritty details that because we just got off and running and we're doing so much so quickly, we never needed to answer these questions. Um, or we did, but we just kept pushing through because there's too much going on. Um, and so really that's, that's what I think next year will be, that will be a big component of what next year will look like from the committee perspective. Um, more systemic um, institutional systems being created so that um, everyone is fully aware of what's going on in different committees, for example, with the newsletter or, um, you know, creating a schedule of different meetings so different committee members can go to different meetings because we all know when the different meetings are, things like that. Um, just allowing for greater organizations so that this work um, can just be, be deepened. And um, that's not 
to say, or that's not to undermine any of the work that has been done this year or to say that it was disorganized, but to make it more organized <laughs> is the goal. Um, to make it more systemic, to make it more entrenched so that, I mean, the goal is to make this second nature. Um, the goal is to make this work continue long beyond any one of us. Um, and so in order to do that, we really have to put structures in place that enable that. So that's what transitioning from this like ragtag committee that is doing incredible work to a committee that is fully organized, fully accessible, and fully fully uh, communicative with all the parties. That's that's the goal. Um, and again, that's not to undermine any of the work that has been done before. Um, but if I may just say, I think that a couple of the comments that were that were brought up, the, the critiques, I don't think that they should go unaddressed. Um, so if I could just take a few minutes, because this is, I'm, I've been a big part of this work and hearing, hearing criticisms or critiques is a part of any process. Um, and I would like to make myself, I guess, accessible to people who perhaps do not agree with the work that I have been so a part of. Um, so hello, my name is Amanda. I am working with the district on thinking about anti-racism and equity issues. Graduated from Sunderland Elementary and Frontier in 2013. And then I graduated from Harvard and I studied this stuff at Harvard. So, I know very much what it is like to be in this district as a person of color, but also to think about issues of racism in this specific context, in this specific community, as a person of color who has grown up in this community and also beyond with my academic training. Um, so I do appreciate those critiques that were raised and I wrote down a couple of the overlaps. Um, and I'm going to pose some questions that do not need to be answered, but I think everyone should think about. There was talk about one side being taught, about a uh, political agenda, um, about a neglect for both sides of, of an argument. And I would be very interested in knowing what is the other side of being against racism? That is what this committee is doing. We are anti-racism. We are against racism. The other side, what is that? From just a colloquial perspective, from just thinking about the formulation of the word, the other side of anti-racism is racism. Why do we want that to be included in our schools? And I know that's not what the, the um, the speakers were trying to insinuate, but what is the other side of this work? What is it? And I would definitively argue that this is not a political issue and that this has nothing to do with politics and has everything to do with humanity. And the students, all of the students, not we are not just a white district. You can just go over to Sunderland and see that. We are not just a white district. And thinking about, are, are all students able to show up fully in classrooms and be recognized for the totality of their identity? Are young people able to come into these classrooms and see themselves reflected in the curriculum that is being taught and recognizing that not all curriculum is good curriculum and that times change and new teaching practices come into play and so as times change and as we evolve, as we strive to be inclusive and better as a community and as a society, stuff has to get let go. Um, so that was getting to the what is being taken out of curriculum. And I think that the idea that 
students, particularly in elementary school, are too young to think about race so that even acknowledging race is causing division. Um, I encourage looking at psychological studies that show that kids at ages two, three, four are able to identify race and by four, five, six are actively being and acting on biases on the basis of race. Children are not colorblind at all. And so we need to be having these conversations so that kids know to respect each other despite what skin color their friends or peers may have. Um, and simply ignoring race does nothing. It's throwing a blanket over something that you know is there. And it, it accomplishes the exact opposite intent. Um, and I would love to know and pursue, you know, offline, of course, what what is the suggestion? If this is the wrong way of going about anti-racism work, what is the suggestion? There are plenty of times when there was an MLK quote thrown out there. There were plenty of times that MLK was told that what he was doing was wrong, what he was doing was incorrect. By the time he was assassinated, he was one of the most hated men in America. But that's not what you're taught. You're taught, I have a dream. You're taught not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And that is all that you're taught, but that is an incomplete history. So what do you suggest be done instead? And are there racist events in this district that led to this? I would argue as one of the people who was a part of authoring the alumni letter that over 200 alumni signed, yes, absolutely. There were racist events within this district that led to that letter, that led to a lot of alumni who have gone out into the world seeing my education was not sufficient and I want young people to have a better understanding of the role that race plays in the US and in the world because the answer is that it does play a role, whether or not you acknowledge it. I understand that was a lot longer than the, the minute that I said I was gonna go on for. But those those are the points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, if if those individuals those um, those those individuals want to you know talk with me as someone who has been deeply involved in this from the very beginning, my email is amanda at frsu thirty eight dot org. I look forward to your emails, hopefully, and. It doesn't matter if you agree with me or not. I do want to hear your perspectives. Um, let's have a conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. We do appreciate both of you coming on. Does anybody have a, I saw Ken, you had your hand raised at one time. You want to say something? I guess not. <laughs> That's just not knowing how to run my iPad. <laughs> That's all right. I hit a wrong button, <laughs> but I did want to say thank you to um, Kelsey and Amanda, not just for their their presentations tonight, but for their hard work. And I do want to thank everyone that participated in public comment this meeting. Um, and I do hope that Amanda has the opportunity to uh, have that dialogue and that the committees have the opportunity to have dialogue and. And we are taking into account all perspectives. So thank you. Um, we have to move on with the agenda or we'll be here until yep. 11 or 12 tonight. So um, I think we're up to the COVID-19 update. Missy, do you, yeah, Missy has her hand up again. If you just. Oh, I'm sorry. Missy, where are you? I just know it takes a minute. Go ahead. Move on to COVID. Who's doing the COVID update? If you want to Am say I, something, go ahead. Yeah, I, I feel good. Darius, why don't I you I feel talk like I'm standing in a doorway where nobody will walk through. <laughs> no, after you, no, after you. Um, I just feel, um, I just want to thank you, um, Amanda, for kind of summarizing, our, and Kelsey, for summarizing our work. And Amanda's thoughts there at the end. I, I think that is, 
it, it is a, um, I can't say it better than, than how it was said, but I just want to say it as my position in the district. It is about having conversations. And people are at different points in those conversations. And, um, you know, I, and I, I just appreciate that we had this conversation this evening as well. So I um, just wanted to kind of say that um, before moving on, because I kind of, kind of felt awkward being quiet. <clears throat> um, the COVID-19 update right. is basically, it, it goes into the next one as well. The, the pool testing has been set up by the state to be paid for for the rest of the year. I know that was on a lot of our minds about, you know, how we're going to fund and pay for that and, you know, how we were going to do that, but that's, that's a nice thing. Um, I encourage anybody who's watching, if you haven't signed up for pool testing, um, our numbers are getting better every day as, as we continue to, you know, put the information out there about it. Um, also, numbers are up in the county. I just want to say that as well, because people are starting to be more lax in their um, approach. Um, and so, I, you know, we are continuing to follow the protocols at school. Um, there was a comment about outdoors. The only one thing I want to clarify about that is when students are outdoors, they are allowed to unmask as long as they're not playing games that are bringing them within close proximity of other students. Um, and teachers can also unmask when they're outdoors as long as they're in close proximity of students as well. So um, I just want to put that out there as, you know, mask breaks are about mask breaks. Many times during those breaks, students elect not to take their masks off because they wear them all day, they forget about them, and they're out and playing and that kind of thing. So um, just kind of putting those kind of small things out. There's nothing really else on COVID-19 that I wanted to bring up. Um, just in general, moving forward, um, but nothing out of what I've said at other, at other meetings. Now Missy has her hand up. Go ahead. Well, that's what I wanted to make sure didn't get uh, kind of glazed over. I don't know, if, Meg, do you want to speak to this or you? Sorry, my computer is being slow. Um, it's waking up. Um, to speak to, I think Darius, you you addressed the um, one of the issues just in terms of the fact that we that kids and staff can take masks off outside. Um, the mask, uh, the state guidance on mask wearing um, has not changed, and that's a really critical part of our um, prevention strategy. So I don't expect that we're going to be making any changes. Um, to the mask policy. Um, and as Darius said, the pool testing program has been very successful. Um, and we are looking to increase participation, especially now that we can go to the end of the school year without um, without concerns about the um, impact on the budgets. So. Thanks, was there anything else in there that very good. We, I missed? Thank you. I will, uh, I'll put in the chat box the link to the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines on mask wearing and return right. to sports, just so that you can have some current medical guidelines that are out there. Um, maybe I can. Thank you, Missy. I'll, I'll, Darius, I'll send it to you and you can put it in there if you don't have it for my email. All right. The and Frontier the, Meeting follows this will be the frontier meeting follows. We are talking about athletics as well, so um, it might be. I was going to say the athletic guidance is pretty clear about mask wearing in sports, and the and the state does have a panel of um, medical experts that work with them on their guidance. Um, and just to thanks, Meg. Clarify: there are kids that are getting COVID, just in response to the public comments. Yeah, yeah there yeah. are. There are kids getting COVID, and currently, if you if, uh, and this has been the case for a number of weeks now, if you look at the state numbers, the state does um, age breakdowns. On uh, their their lowest age group is uh, under 20, um, and that continues to be the highest case numbers, and has been for um, quite some time. Um, and we mm -hmm. we have we have had students in our district um, get sick, and we have had those students transmit. Um, generally to family members, which can be a hard thing for a family to um, to then negotiate. Um, so. Anyway, not a happy ending note, sorry. <laughs> as, as, one of, as one of the older people on the committee, I think maybe Bill might be older than me, but I've been vaccinated for two weeks. If you have your chance to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Um, I still wear my mask when I go into places or if I'm seeing customers out there, I still wear it. I always ask them, do you want me to wear it? And they'll say yes or no. And 
and usually their older people have been vaccinated and stuff. So, but if you have a chance, get vaccinated. Trevor, you have something? Well, I, I know Carrie wants to speak, uh, Carrie Mitchell, so I'll wait wait till she's done. Okay. She, she I don't hand up. Yep. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Yep, you're uh, I'm curious. Uh, in the fall, there was, I think, a policy that if it was over 80 degrees, schools would be remote, so kids wouldn't have be breathing the hot air and getting overheated in their masks. Is that still the policy as we heat up? No. Yeah. So that was one of the things we collectively bargained. In, uh, not collect, we bargained with the uh, uh, with the associations for remote learning at that time. Um, I've met with the association and had that removed. We're still talking about it, but right now um, I don't want to degrees. Heat is funny, especially when we're talking about frontier. Um, being the three story building, the third floor gets very hot faster than other floors. Sometimes it doesn't air out well at night when it's hot. If it doesn't cool down during the day, so. Um, you know, relative temperature outside doesn't actually talk about the temperature inside. So, but right now, because we do not have the remote options, if we were to close due to heat, we'd be making up those days. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, there's uh, certainly more access to outdoors and how to run things. And so we're going to have to play that right now. It's going to be like snow days and I take all the information from all the different points and figure out what's the best thing to do um, on those hotter days. Okay, thank you. The, the good news is when everybody was upset at me for not canceling snow days, for not having snow <laughs> days, we're getting out the tent. Woohoo! <laughs> hey, we Trevor, might still get Trevor. snow. Watch it. I just wanted to say yes that we are still Trevor. seeing a, a, uh, we are still seeing a very stubborn amount of cases in in Deerfield and and surrounding communities, but with the variants coming on uh, stronger and stronger, you you can be vaccinated and still get COVID. It doesn't mean that you are not going to get the disease. You can still get it. You can still pass it on to your loved ones. Um, the the beauty and hopefully the, the benefit of the vaccination is that you will not wind up on a in the hospital or on a respirator. So um, so that that that's really the goal of all this to keep people from from dying, but definitely can still get it, definitely can still pass it on. So uh, please get a vaccination whenever you have the ability to and um, and mask up. And um, and generally, people running around on the field get red faces and out of breath. So um, I don't think the mask is the one that's causing that, that issue. It's, it's hopefully good exercise. But um, anyways, that, yeah, that's it from the health department. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to go right on to some new business here. We'll try to go right through these things. Hopefully, there's not many questions. Um, the first is uh, we're going to vote on the 2021-2022 Frontier Regional School calendar. So the calendar is the same for the most part um, before the Union 38 and the Frontier. So we probably could do a joint discussion about any concerns about that. Um, let me try to pull it up so I can share it with all of you. And then, um, you know, this calendar, well, um, let me find it here. Um, <clears throat> um, it's coming. Hang on. So I figure it's probably easiest just to have it up and people can ask any questions about what we're doing. Um, we are looking at early release days again, happening on Friday. That would that was also the reason for Sarah and him explaining the calendar of what's being done with professional development. We kind of said from the beginning when we started those early release days, um, you know, that we would you know be showing what we're working on and, and how we're working on that. Um, the first day of school, as people can see, is the is up here on is the Thursday, doing a two-day week. Um, having a two-day week before going to the four-day week with Labor Day on Friday. Again, I'll, doing that extended long weekend for Labor Day with the Monday off. It's kind of it's been a uh, certainly something that's done out in Eastern Mass. Most schools are doing this now, especially with the earlier start. Kind of gives a closing weekend for families for the summer for the earlier start. I really like the um, the start with the two-day start 
not everybody wants to go back as early, but I like that, especially for younger students. Um, and I think staff will admit that, you know, the first couple of days and the anxiety built up that week just drains people. Um, it's good to have a kind of a start, you know, the reset and then go to a, a four day week after that. So that's what we're looking at the start of the school year. Um, the early release days, we did, you know, we were doing Wednesdays this year. We did poll parents overwhelmingly. They wanted Fridays. Um, I think it was 70, some, 70 something percent in that survey we sent out. So we were considering going to the Wednesday model. Um, there was some positives on there, but um, you know, looking at the, you know, when building, building schedules is important to get the, the feedback that we got from parents there. Um, professional development day, even on election day. I mean, I don't have to walk through the whole thing, I guess. I guess the start of school is the is the biggest thing. Right now, we don't know the 185th day, just so people know we put that in there because there are snow days. Um, and so when people are planning their vacations, they, they don't think that the last day of school is absolutely the ninth. It really could be up to the 16th or, or more or less. And so that just remind that's there to remind people there. And um, yeah, that's kind of the overall the, the summary of the calendar. So any questions on the calendar or why things are done? If we have no questions, I don't see any, but if we have any questions. Keith, or, Keith has his hand up, as I can see on okay. the screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, about snow days. Uh, is, is there any bird, uh, online or combination or something like that? I mean, I really hope that this, the state is, right now we're, you know, we asked that at the, with the commissioner and he kind of chuckled. He said, you're talking about that, are you talking about next year's snow days already? Um, you know, so we haven't heard, you know, he didn't give an answer on that, I think a lot of things, um, but, yeah, but so right now we're waiting to see. I think if we do that, I think we should look at a combined model, but that'll be, hopefully we'll have that at a joint meeting next year. We'll, we'll talk about the school community calendar in a minute, um, but hopefully that'll be a, at our joint meeting in October. We'll be discussing whether or not how we want to treat snow days. Do we want to do a combination? Do we like the, you know, let's take a little bit of something we did with the remote learning and education we did this this year and, and, and translate it to something different. So anything else? So how about a motion from Frontier for the school calendar? Motion. Second. second. Can I get a Missy second? I'll let you do the roll call, Judy. Could we get, could we get a motion yep. from Union 38? So moved. Who would say, Bob? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do we have a second? Second, Jessica Corwin. Yes, Jessica Corwin again. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Bob. Okay, it's, it's on both, <clears throat> on the floor for both committees. Judy, do you want to do a roll call? Or yep. do we, any other discussion before we go to the floor? I'll turn it over to Judy. Okay, this is Frontier Votes, Bob? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Bill? Yes. Judy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Ken, do you want voting members or everybody? Did you forget Lynn? Voting members. No, I said Lynn, didn't I? Lynn? I'm sorry <laughs> if I left you. <laughs> Whatever, my eyes glazed over when I got to the last row. <laughs> okay, voting members for Poor 38. <laughs> um, Phil? Yes. David? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Bob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Ken? Yes. I'm sure Ken is waving at me. Somewhere. <laughs> I'm just going to jump over him. Um, Carrie? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Peter? Is Peter waving at me again? Yep, he is. Thank you, Peter. Um, Maureen? Yes. And Bethany? Yes. All right. Good job. Next thing, next on the Thank agenda is. <clears throat> Next on the school count is a uh, school committee meeting schedule. Um, I just want to 
I know it, it was talked a little bit before I came on tonight. I caught it, but I'm, I'm making a suggestion in Waitley when it, when we have our meeting tomorrow night that we go back to in-person meetings. If the kids are going back to school, I my personal opinion, and, and I'm not sure about the logistics, but I think we should be going back to in-person school committee meetings. That's just my opinion. So basically, Bob, just to kind of put you there, that becomes the priority of each chair. So um, just kind of a kind of the point of order there. So each chair is going can decide how they want to move back. I know Waitley is looking to going back to in-person meetings. You know, looking at the first, let's just looking at the calendar. Um, you know, there is that question of, you know, there is a convenience factor to being able to do remotely and and whether or not we lose any. Besides, you know, long-term remote, I would say we lose, but it, you know what I don't have in this calendar because I don't know what the open meeting was, if that's going to change, but it'll be interesting if we wove in um, virtual meetings and in-person meetings throughout the year. Um, and that's something that the committee can discuss. It's your meeting. I come up with a calendar just to kind of help guide, uh, but it, they are your meetings. And so the only thing we have to do is make sure we orchestrate with each other. Um, as you can see, I put up there, you know, basically, um, what I'm proposing again is to stack some of our meetings. You know what, they say 5.30 on here, it should say six, we made a change because an hour and a half wasn't enough. Um, so it should be four and six o'clock when it says 5.30. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's a mistake on. It should be 5.30 and seven, right? Triple stack, that's right. Yeah, we try to do that, we do wait with an hour and a half because it's, it's a smart class. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. So, um, so anyway, this is what I'm proposing. Again, a joint meeting on, in October. Also, um, here's a change looking at December. December is not a busy month meeting wise. It's very hard to you know, um, schedule in with all the different activities that are happening in the month of December. Um, and you know, budgets aren't started yet. Usually we say, hey, the meetings are usually short. We're like, hey, budgets are starting, you know, that kind of stuff. And there's not a whole lot of, we went back and looked at agendas. I'm thinking about putting no scheduled meetings in December and see um, how you feel about that. There's no rule that you have to have a monthly meeting. You have meetings at your discretion. Also remember, as school committees review this, you can have a meeting anytime. We are trying to you know, have our monthly meetings kind of preset in advance. And we certainly have proved that we can have a meeting at any time this year. Um, January, the format got messed up here. Um, but again, um, once we hit February, we start having separate meetings on separate nights because it's budget season. We can't really have meetings because they go longer in the thick of, um, of that kind of stuff. Um, the budget. So as we know, those are longer, more intense meetings. So anyways, this is what I'm kind of putting together again, um, again, April, a joint meeting, and then going back in May. And then, um, you know, June meetings if required, if needed. So discussion that, so I mean, Bob brings up the point of whether or not you're gonna have them in person or not. I think you can probably decide that as each individual committee, because um, I believe that is the power of each chair to decide that. Sorry, Bob, don't mean to shoot you down, but I do no. want to make sure we keep the oh, no, decision no. power into those who make those decisions. Not, not, not a problem. Uh, I, I can only think of two things to say about that is, we, we, if you recall, we did try a, a, a meeting in person uh, when we went back to in, in person in the schools at Deerfield uh, for one month. Um, but right now we still have the state guidelines that don't allow gatherings of uh, much more than 10 or 15 people. So if we have a public meeting, yes, the school committee can be face-to-face -face and, and the administrators, but we can't have public in there at this point in time. So um, I, you know, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that there are still logistical issues that are going on. I, I think we, <clears throat> I would be saying that Deerfield would probably finish out the year remotely, but, but um, then I'm one voice, one voice. So uh, that's just my thought. So. Well, it's good to have everybody's thought about this too, Ken. So that's so. good. Mm -hmm. Um. Anybody else out there have anything they'd want to say, or do we want to move to a vote on the uh, school committee meeting schedule as proposed? Yeah. Bob, I would say that I would say that maybe 
I got a feeling that you might be jumping. Maybe, maybe you might be jumping the gun by a month or two on the in-person meeting. So maybe June, maybe September, but not May. That's why I want people to chime in and give their opinion on it. So we could talk a little bit at our <clears throat> meeting too. If anybody else has anything, we could talk to it in our meeting, which which is after this. Sure. Thanks, Phil. If there's so, if there's nothing else, can we have a motion from Frontier for accepting the school committee calendar? Move for the region, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. That was Olivia. And mm -hmm. can we have a motion? Yeah. Can we have a motion from the uh, Union Thirty Eight Committee? So moved. Bob. And a second. second. Thank you. So they're both in place. Any other thoughts or comments out there? I think so. No. I'm not hearing anything. Okay, Frontier, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, Good job. Voting members of Union 38, raise your hands. Oh, I'm not a voting member. I'm already challenged by my own guidelines. Okay, approved. Next on the agenda is June. Go ahead. Uh, next thing is June tenth. We all set, Judy. Oh. Yeah, we are. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Bob, Juneteenth. It's, it's June nineteenth is Emancipation Day. Last year, Governor Baker made that a um, state holiday. Um, and that's going to have implications as us as employers. And so what's going to happen in regards to, um, is that a, a paid day off um, and our abilities around that? I should send you the guidance from our attorney to look through. Um, I may have jumped the gun to throw this on the agenda without preparation. That's why I sent an email right before this because I think we probably need to review, talk it over. This year, um, June 19th falls on a Saturday. And when it falls on a Saturday, it's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, observed on a Saturday. So we don't really, we're in no rush. To, originally when I was putting this together, I was like, we have to get this kind of put in place for this June. Um, but we don't because it's not gonna affect us. It's not gonna affect employees in our, of our district this year. So um, I think it's gonna take a, a longer conversation because there's also collective bargaining that could be if we're doing paid holidays, is that gonna be a paid holiday if, you know, that kind of thing. And then we also work as um, extensions of towns and I didn't have the research on what the towns are doing regarding this holiday and if it's a paid holiday there. So if there's wasn't fully prepared as I should have been as I was kind of reviewing and putting this together that, um, so I wanted to get people thinking about it, looking through the legality of it, um, not the legality of it, but the legal briefing from the, the lawyer about what we, what we must do and what we don't have to do and then decide you know how we move forward on that. Um, so we do really have until we can even carry this through to the next joint meeting but we do have to work together on that because if we have one town doing one thing versus another or school rather, I think you guys all get that. Um, I think Damien had his hand up. Uh, yeah, just uh, since you brought it up and it is on the agenda and just to clarify, I did read the um, uh, letter you got from uh, the attorney today. So uh, if you could just comment on uh, is is the collective bargaining that we currently have right now? Is it written as uh, all state holidays, or is it written per date? They are listed in our collective bargaining agreement, so we would have to. It okay. is something that would be bargained with the association. So, um, again, so and then we'd have to look at you know what is if, is there a cost there? What's the cost analysis, and and, and so on and so forth. If it's a paid holiday versus a holiday off, and 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 those kind of things, so um, yeah, so it's a lot. It's a lot bigger chunk than just yeah. It's a it's an appropriate holiday. We should be celebrating it. You know, that's already been set by the state. We will be off that day next year. We have a ton of snow days, and we end up going into June nineteenth. We will be off that day. The question is whether or not there's going to be it's going to be a paid holiday, and so forth. And we have to kind of and who would be paid and those kind of things because there's a lot of different. Um, you have people on contracts, you have people, um, you know, from, you know, from all across the board from um, office um, support and positions to 
custodians to whatever. And so it's a it's a bigger it's a bigger bite. And so for us to start thinking about that, and also I wanted to be able to talk with the towns about what they're doing in regards to that, and so that we don't um, cause any let's say greater tension between us doing one thing and them doing another. Maybe working together on that. So. I, I was kind of late to the game and realizing it was a much bigger thing than so. Is that is that something we'll bring, bring, bring up in September? Yeah, so I guess I'm asking for us to just any questions on it tonight to so you have an idea about it, that we table it, and I bring it back to the next joint meeting. It's also, we have a pretty lengthy agenda of other stuff still going through um, and then the Frontiers meeting after this due to timing. So um, I, that's why, I, I guess that's what I'm asking. And it's your your committee, you can, you guys can do what you want there. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion. We could table it. I'll second that. I don't even think we need to make a motion. I don't think so. Well. I don't think we do either. <laughs> okay. Okay. I withdraw my second. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll pull my motion. <laughs> okay. Superintendent's, Superintendent's evaluation. evaluation. All right, in double, double and gum there. Um, so yeah, so basically, I am I've created another uh, evaluation, like I set it up last year, um, before. You know, uh, and basically, what we did last year is we had one of the chairs kind of officially collect all the information. Donna will do the the legwork on it. Um, she doesn't know that yet, but she will. Um, and then we kind of have, we kind of put a chair in charge of that. I think Ken, did you do it last year? Just we have to kind of formalize it. So I created once again in a um, a Google survey portion. I will have the highlights of what we what I've been doing under each section. If you have instead of providing evidence on every single thing I've done, which is was the the state's guidance, we've had a conversation about you really want me to spend 100 hours telling you what I've been doing all year long. Instead, I've just listed it. And if, if you want more information on those kind of things, on any of the bullets, on any of the, any of the math board, um, I did add a section that says no rating, which is not on the state's thing, but school committees were very frustrated of being forced to rate something when they didn't have knowledge. And they wanted to be able to say, like, I don't know. You know, so I give you satisfactory because I don't know. And so instead, we have a no rating. Um, and then what we do is um, the, whoever we, we, you folks, um, elect to kind of oversee the survey. We'll collect the surveys from Donna, go through them, basically do a summary of what the surveys are, um, and so forth. So kind of how we've done it in the past. Um, and then at the next joint meeting, it can even be into next year, you can then you know, formalize vote the evaluation of the superintendent. So um, that's that's the thought. It has to be discussed at this committee, so it's on the agenda. I think... I think last year, Ken and I both, I took care of, of all the Frontier School Committee members and Ken took care of all Union 38 and then Donna put it together. Um, mm -hmm. we, we so it's ready to go. So I, 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 will, I will send it out. Um, you know, what, what I'll do is, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send it out. It's the same as last year and it just has the different summaries of each of the a different standards. So um, I can send it out and you folks can get it done. I'll put a deadline in. Um, I also want to recognize that we have members that there may be turnover in the board and um, want to make sure that those members are able to evaluate before they leave as well. So um, sure. So timing wise, it's kind of moved up a little bit. If if somebody didn't do it last year because they thought it'd be hard to do, it's, it's, it isn't hard to do. It's very easy to do. Um, it you know means a lot when we can get hundred percent it never happens but if we can get a hundred percent this year with what's going on it would it would make me happy and I know it'll make Ken happy if we can get a hundred percent participation on it and stuff so yeah you know I guess but as I said last year just a reminder everyone you know I I do accept feedback all year long so I appreciate you know correcting um, me along the way is, is far more beneficial than a summary at the end of the year but this is is, is required by law um, so also note that it's a public document. So if you, um, you know, write a funny joke to me in it, it's a public document for other people to read. So, um, and you do have to, you do have to write comments if you are giving outside of satisfactory, you have to explain why you, you're giving such comments. So um, it is explained in there, but I'm just saying it out loud um, as in there as well. So, okay, we good? Good.
<clears throat> All right, the next, so the next thing on the- Oh, we got a vote on it. Donna put a vote on this. Okay. Just put a vote on, on what, superintendent's on accepting evaluation? The, on, on accepting the evaluation plan, yeah. Oh. It's not part of the vote. I mean, there's no vote. D don't vote it. Don't vote it, moving on. I didn't see, yeah, I don't see a, yeah. vote vote on it it's, it's a legal document i probably i missed that when she put this thing together i should have got that it's a you know you have to do it by law you have to follow the state metrics and the form i used to create to follow the state metrics for evaluation so yeah. you want to go on with the next one there darius please yes the next one is that the um the director of business administration Ms. Pareda, has requested to um negotiate her contract um with the committee um, and basically, so we have on the agenda tonight an executive session where we can go into an executive session to discuss the, the, the contract of a non-union employee to strategize how you want to negotiate that contract. So that is um, basically what is on here. So we would leave to go to an executive session to discuss um, to discuss the strategy and wish to do that and whether or not a subcommittee would be creative is what I, I believe I sent the email out what I would propose. You know, 25 of you doing that is not probably not the best mode. Um, but so we'd create a subcommittee, but what we would do, we would leave this, um, we would leave this, go to executive session, discuss it, come back, announce the subcommittee, if that's what we chose to do, um, and then adjourn the meeting. Um, FYI, Frontier is on the same channel as this. We decided to have having multiple links that will just continue on this site. So I have someone watching this site when we go to executive session, um, and then we can come back and then Frontier will open it for the Frontier short business they have after this. Thoughts, comments? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, David. Can I I'm just curious, do we really have to go through the time of going into executive session if we're just talking about process and nothing specific about you know, sub evaluation and, and can we just do, if somebody puts a motion now to get a representative from each of the school committee, <clears throat> a small committee and move this forward, wouldn't that be efficient? You well, certainly can do that. Um, the only thing that you would be, if the rest of the committee, you would be giving up, you you have to enter that negotiation in good faith with that person. So if there was any ceilings or any things that you wanted within the contract, length of contracts or any parameters that you wanted to, to be certain that the negotiating team, the full committee wanted within that. Then you wow. have to do that prior to going to negotiation. You can't bring it back and then tear the thing apart because you didn't want it that way. So as long as people are fine with that, that they're electing somebody to take the full process through, and then it comes back for a final vote to the school committee. Does that make sense, David? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think that's part of the benefit of delegating to a committee is they do take it on and it has to be ratified in the end anyway. But I'll, I'm just, I was just trying to be efficient. And you certainly can do that, folks. Yeah, I, I'm just, you know. Yeah, I had, I had suggested the um, executive session mainly from the perspective of what Darius just uh, mentioned. Are you still talking, Darius? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, it was mainly to see, A, if, you know, we wanted to do the subcommittee, and B, if there were specific parameters that we wanted as a you know as a joint committee for that uh subcommittee to uh stay within within parameters or or any anything along those lines so it just seemed to make the most sense rather than designate a subcommittee have them negotiate a contract come back discuss it as a full committee and then as darius mentioned maybe tear it apart and we end up back at square one again so that was why i had suggested an executive session <clears throat> but we can also take emails. Can't we take emails on if somebody had a question about something? Nope. I mean, no. the contract no. the contract that we have with her right now is one of the newer contracts with, you know, no more buyback of, you know, uh, of, of sick time and all that stuff. So it's pretty much one of the newer contracts that we do have with non-union personnel. Just can't, you know. just can't deliver or in a, in a, uh, in an email. That's all. Right. You, you can't. Yeah. Right. 
So, so I'll, I'll do a motion to adjourn to executive session. For, <laughs> Thank you. For Union, for Union 38 and for. <laughs> Was that the baby? Uh, Frontier. Oh, a double, a double oh. motion by Phil. That's double, double motion. motion. I'll second the union, Trevor. I'll, I'll second the um, Frontier. Okay. I'm not going to ask for roll call. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. Weeks. Can't do it by hand. Why can't we do it by hand? You, you want to do it by names? Okay. Yep, That's fine. Right. Okay. That's fine. Yep. For Frontier, Bob? You can see. Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Uh, Phil? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Judy, yes. Bill? Yes. Missy? <clears throat> yes. Olivia? Yes. For Frontier Union 38, uh, Phil? Yes. David? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Robert? Bob, sorry. Yes. Michael? Yes. Ken? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Peter? I'm looking at you. You can wave at me. Where'd he go? There he is. Good. Uh, Maureen? Yes. And Bethany? Yes. Okay, 802, see you on the other side. Sign out and go over to the... Everybody make sure you sign out. All administrators besides Frontier, you're welcome to go. Don't start without me. Thanks, Gary. <clears throat> So does somebody want to make a motion on who we chose for the subcommittee for the business managers negotiation? Right. Judy, you did, did we lose you, Judy? It's not voted, Bob, so you don't need yeah. to do a motion. You just simply announce it that it was a, you've appointed okay. the following people. Okay. I just wanted to see where Judy is. And we need Judy. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, there she is. Judy? Yeah, I'm here. So you have the list of the you wanna you wanna say the five or six names for the subcommittee? Oh you had to ask. I closed the meeting minutes. Hold on. Invitation edit. That's not it. Honestly, uh, the meeting, the, sorry, That's the right. negotiating committee will consist of from Frontier, Bob Halla and Judy Pierce, from Union 38, Phil Cantor, Bethany and Jessica, sorry, Beth, Beth Riley and Jessica Corwin. I think you forgot Deerfield, Carrie yeah, Etchels. Yeah, Carrie Etchels as well. Yep. Oh, Carrie, sorry. That's what happens when you don't read what's in front of you. <laughs> <clears throat> if there's nothing else, Union 38 can adjourn. So like we the, need to vote in committee, right? Huh? Do we have to, uh, the Donna's note said on a motion from to nominate blah, blah, blah. Are we, are we going to just announce the vote or are we going to actually revote the vote? We're just going to announce it, right? Announce what vote? The, the negotiation committee does not need to be voted on. It's appointed by the. It was appointed in. Okay. Sub Sorry, I'm just reading it as she laid it out for me. She votes everything. Yep. Very democratic. <laughs> she is very democratic. So, as my last act as a school committee member, I would like to make make a motion to adjourn for the union. Trevor. I'll second Trevor's motion to adjourn for Union 38. Oh, you're supposed to let Maisie do it. <laughs> oh, oh Maisie, she left. left. <laughs> <laughs> she left. So.
Sorry, Michael. No, thank you all. Pleasure to work with you. All right. Meanwhile, Frontier staying on. With, we got to power through it just a little bit more. By Union 38. Second All right, time. Frontier. Let me go to my next I'm going to need like an hour to collect myself after this one. Does anybody need two seconds? I need two seconds. Let me just okay. go find the minutes for this meeting, okay? Just okay. let me bounce. I have yeah. Everything is flagged. It's a hot mess. Are we not voting on the motion to adjourn for Union yeah, 38? You raised your hand. Everybody left. <laughs> okay. Jessica votes. Thanks, Leave Jessica, for, for keeping That's it fun, real. <laughs> What happens if you don't adjourn a meeting legally? Like, I want the district this attorney to uh, the, going. This is what happens. we get three hour meetings. <laughs> this is going to be short and sweet. So, yes. We'll, we'll, maybe. we'll see. Poor you Judy. know what? While. Well, um, no, it's okay. I, I, I can't. Get get if Judy, why don't, why don't we just keep things moving while you get your stuff together? Yep, Carl, just kind of get Carl could just give a quick overview of what this the athletics. So we had to have this meeting tonight because fall athletics is going to start right after vacation. So unless you want another meeting just to talk about fall athletics this month, we had to have a meeting for you to approve fall athletics, I mean spring athletics for athletics to happen, right? So that's why we're right here doing this one now. So um, Carl's just going to give a quick overview. Quick, Carl, they want quick. Because you guys yes. all got the document. It will be spring sports if you say yes. Is that quick enough? <laughs> 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 all right. Um, so the quick rundown, the MIA and the EA have approved all the typical spring sports we have. Um, wrestling was moved to the spring. That's still in limbo right now from the MIA. They, they basically are like trying not to make a vote on it until the last second. Um, but other than that, um, some some differences is we are trying to play outside of the Franklin County bubble a little bit and play our normal league schedules. Um, so on that document that uh, John Hathaway shared with everybody, I listed all the schools. Um, other things, we would continue following all the guidelines that we've been following currently, which things have been going well. Um, other school, Turner's, Hopkins, Franklin Tech, Mahar have all already approved. Um, their spring sports, the other, one, other ones are pending. Um, other things, uh, the MIA has also, this is, I guess, a big news thing. Um, they have approved a <laughs> Western Mass tournament and state tournament. Um, so, in, but this year that would be an opt in. So, schools don't have to qualify, they can just say, We want to play in the tournament. Uh, one of the positive things when thinking about the decision if we're going to opt in is that that's. The regular season goes until June 15th. So any tournament, like the kids would be already out of school. So um, that's a positive thing in terms of bringing, we're gonna bring all the kids back, but they won't be at school when they're playing in the tournaments. So um, that's the quick, that's the quick thing. Carl, the only other, the only thing else yeah. I wanna throw on that is that the spring sports, while we're expanding it slightly, you're talking about baseball, softball, tennis, track, none of them are contact sports, contact sports. other yeah. than, you know, you know, short slides into home or something like that. Yeah, yeah, on all outside and um, yes, thank you, Darius. Thanks, Carl. Anybody have a question for Carl? I do. Just, I just, I, I heard something and I just wanna, I don't know if it's right because, you know, the kids are all having their um, captain's practices and stuff for track and they're very excited. I just wanna make sure what I'm hearing is correct. So um, I heard that if we opt into post season that we, that means we allow for people to come to our school. Um, that we have to part of the postseason circuit, um, and my concern with that is um, if we're going to have a track, if they're going to start the track, and we don't, we can't offer that. Would they then pull the kids um, from being able to do postseason? Am I making sense? I'm yeah, not sure if I'm making. That sense. makes sense. Uh, a couple things. First, uh, the schedule makers. I talked to the schedule makers for track and told them that. They could start working on the track in June. So all of our home meets are in May. Uh, May. Um, if there's a tournament, the only problem would be practices because uh, all mm -hmm. the all the state stuff is usually other places. Um, right. 
So that's a great question. Um, my, I mean, my first thought to bring that up is all the DA kids will be gone and I can make a phone call over there and hopefully they can help us out like they did a little bit with the soccer season this year. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, if the, the track has to, being redone comes first in that, in that sense, because we got to get it done. Right. And so I just, so what you're saying is that it's, it won't impact, we'll be able, there's ways to work around, not, they won't pull the kids from having post season because we don't, can't offer. No, no, no. Awesome. No. The Great. people who run those tournaments are athletic directors and principals. They're going to be, they're not like, <laughs> they're not like, you know what I mean? They're going to, they'll work with us and all that stuff. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Keith. Yeah, just a quick question about the number of uh, people attending games. Does that change beyond the media family, or are we going to stay with what it has been? Um, I think that, I mean, the final decision on that, I think, goes with the Board of Health. But um, there, I mean, so it gets a little more interesting when we start playing baseball and softball in these open areas as opposed to soccer and football, which are in the stadium. Um, so we're going to obviously follow any guidelines by the EEA and the MIA that they set. Um, but again, we're outside and it, the people so far for fall two have been amazing about spreading out and being spaced. So, I, you know, I, I feel as good as I can about it unless the Board of Health says, you know, we shouldn't do that because you know, them being the experts and all. Thanks. Missy, you had a question, Missy? You got to. You're muted, honey. Me? I was going to ask the same question. Okay. There, uh, Damien, you got a question? Uh, yeah, more just a comment. I, I know this is a long meeting, so I'll make it really quick. But I just want to say how important uh, these athletics have been for the kids. Um, my daughter had her first JV soccer game uh, this uh, the other day, and she came home so excited about it. I haven't seen her with a, a big smile on her face like that in so long. And uh, she's then was also asked, and she's been pulled up to play in the varsity game on Saturday and she is through the roof about it. So just uh, really how important these athletics have been for the kids. It's great. Thanks, Damien. Anybody else have a question for Carl? Carl, thanks for staying with us tonight, L late night for you. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, Judy, uh, did you put a time when we started? Uh, this one, um, hold on, I got three going on. I started us at 827. Okay, good. Um, how about we re review improved minutes? March 2nd, 2021. Special meeting, March 5th, 2021. Uh, minutes from March 9th, 2021. And a special meeting on March 23rd, 2021. Moved okay. it. Thank you, Bill. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Thank you, Judy. Want to do roll call? I do, Bob. Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Is Damien yes. still on? Oh, thanks. Keith? Yes. No, I lost which one I'm at. Jesus. Uh, Phil? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Judy, yes. Phil? Yes. Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Thank you. And the so, last thing I think for tonight, Darius, is the change yeah. in schedule. So, Bob, just to follow up on that, so the Board of Health is meeting tomorrow night at 645 to have this discussion. They moved it to 645 because of a public hearing at 6 o'clock for Waitley, so they kind of put a space in. Whether or not Bob and I will make it on time, one of us will be there. Um, they are pretty much, we've been working with, as Carl will tell you, and he already left, I think. Um, we've been working hand in hand about what we're doing here, so I don't expect any excitement at that. Um, I did post the meeting in case everybody showed up that we didn't break any open meeting laws if a discussion occurred. Did one we vote? Things like if one committee goes to another committee's meeting, can they talk? But so I posted it anyways tomorrow at 6 45. Um, they're just going to decide whether or not to allow us to have contests on those sports, which we believe the answer is yes, since we're playing football right now. I imagine we can play baseball. Did so, we ever vote to participate in spring sports? We did fall too. Did we do spring? Oh, you're saying, we're, oh, we haven't done the vote for that. Is that what you say we didn't, didn't we just do that vote for that? 
No, no we just did meeting minutes. Oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> move, to approve, move to approve the reports, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. Can yes. I get a hand raise? And Missy hey, has her hand up already, too. Yeah, um, Darius, can you just, for the matter of public record, toss that uh, that link to the AAP guidance on masks in sports? I don't have it available in my hand. I know. I just emailed it to you. Oh. Thank you, Missy, on that. Yeah, no problem. I just, people should know what the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending. Yeah. Is there a public comment to the contrary? Yes. There it is. Thank you. Right, thank you. So, anyways, as I was saying, well, so there's a meeting tomorrow at six forty-five. If you want to attend that, um, it'll be basically it'll probably be super quick. They got a big agenda as well. So. Um, well, I'll, Bob or I will be there to make sure it shepherds through. Um, the, the last thing on the agenda is, you know, we did, we were talking about bringing the middle school coming back on the 28th. Um, I discussed at the last meeting, we didn't talk about high school. We since have moved the high school to come, the high school to come back on May 3rd, the following Woo Monday. We were gonna have them come back on the same day and we kind of went back and forth. Administratively, we wanna bring one group at a time and then wait a few days to bring the other group back. Um, the billing ad does act as one in, um, in negotiations and talking with the union and such that, um, you know, getting everybody to come back was is in the best interest of everybody. And so we we aren't waiting for the state for that call to be made. We go ahead, we've gone ahead and started planning on that. So kind of order of operations, I know I may have kind of shifted there, but I, I did get, that I had the teachers on board with that. So um, at least there's a majority on board um, to, to get those students back, so. Livy, do you have a question, Your hands up? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question about the change of schedule at all for Darius? If not, I need a motion to adjourn this nice long evening. Move to adjourn. Uh, well, hold on before we adjourn. And Donna also put a vote for this one. So are we voting it or are we just talking about it? This one what? Darius. The re return to school. The you know, you probably returns. should. You know, with this one, I would vote because you're changing the schedule. All right. So we need, need a motion. motion. Thank you. Yep, Judy will motion it. Who's in a second? Second. Thank you, Bill. Roll call, or do you want a hand raise? Hand raise. Damien, raise your hand. Damien. I think it's he's frozen. just frozen. He's frozen. He is frozen. Can he talk? Damien, say yes. Yes, I'm in a Thank hotel. You, the, the, internet, the internet here is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion to adjourn. Can we get a second? Yes. yes. Second. <laughs> Raise your hands. Good thanks. job. Hey, Thank thanks, you, everybody. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Long night. We got a lot mm -hmm. done.